Good afternoon. Welcome to the fifth session of This is Film, Film Heritage in Practice. My name is Giovanna Fossati. I'm the chief curator of I Film Museum and a professor at the University of Amsterdam focusing on film heritage. This is film is a collaboration between the University of Amsterdam, uh, uh, I Film Museum and uh, Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis. During the sessions, the master students of the This is Film class help to introduce and interview our guests. Welcome all to all the This is Film students following the course this year. This is Film is also available online. Uh, the lectures and Q&A can be found on the I website for free. The films screened during the sessions are available on the iFilm player for a small fee. This year we are focusing on the theme of recycling, reusing and remixing arch archival films. Together with our guest speakers, we explore and discuss ethical, legal, political and aesthetic questions related to the reuse of archival films. As usual, each session of This is Film includes an introduction, a Q&A and a screening. To introduce today's session, I would like to talk about the Bits and Pieces collection, which will be reused by our guest for the VJ set she will perform for us this afternoon. To understand how the Bits and Pieces collection came about, first we have to go back 34 years to the Netherlands Film Museum, today I Film Museum, in 1987. In that year, the museum changed quite dramatically its course under its new director, Hoes Blotkamp, who worked closely together with Belgian filmmaker, scholar, cinephile and writer Eric de Kuyper first, and filmmaker and writer Peter Delpeut later. Uh, they became the first two museums' artistic and deputy directors. In those years, a regime change in uh, Del Peut's words took place, which made the museum undertake restoration and presentation practices that were mainly moved by the aesthetic value of films or cinematographic appreciation, as expressed by uh, film archivist and scholar Mar Paul Meyer. And that was done rather than uh, fo focusing on their historical and canonical relevance. Indeed, the focus of the Film Museum shifted from the celebrated centerpieces of official film history to its margins. Fitting examples of this new direction is the unprecedented attention given to non-fiction films uh, from the teens and the restoration of silent films uh, with their original colors. This shift in focus can be interpreted in light of the new film history movement, the movement of media historians dedicated to rewriting film history as a social history of film cultures instead of merely a art history of the moving image, as well as the media archaeological approach emerging at the time and the renewed interest in archival holdings. The Film Museum's shift in perspective went a step further as it did not just lock the interest of film historians and archivists on the forgotten non-canonical films of the silent era. It also promoted creative engagement with, the, with and reuse of archival films. In my view, this has been one of the most uh, visionary components of the policy laid out by Blotkamp, De Kuyper and Del Peut, as it is still informing new archival practices that are emerging today, more than 30 years later. 
The perfect example of this new element are the compilations of field fragments restored and presented in programs known as bits and pieces. Indeed, bits and pieces are not only curated compilations, but also the source of infinite possible new compilations. And as such, the archetype of reuse and or remix as we know it today. What are bits and pieces? Let's start by discussing more in details uh, what bits and pieces are while we watch the bits and pieces compilation number 416 to 425, edited by Mark Paul Mayer in 1997. Eric de Kuyper started the bits and pieces uh, tradition in 1989, shortly after becoming the artistic director of the uh, Netherlands Film Museum. Peter Del Peut, who followed de Kuyper as artistic director of the museum, wrote about the collection in a number of papers. In 1997, he, he referred to the bits and pieces project with these words, I quote, in many film archives, fragments are disappearing in the trash. They are difficult to catalog, and who will ever want to look at them if there is so little knowledge about them? Eventually, the solution turned out to be to make a small collection of the most beautiful fragments. Eric de Kuyper came up with the name of Bits and Pieces. Now, these snippets are preserved, each with um, its own number, and more importantly, they are used, that is, shown, because all those scraps appear to have been invented to play with, to mix and match them, and to transform them into new film experiences." End of quote. One can say that bits and pieces, as concept and practice, are born from a reassessment of canonical film history. But with the years, they have surpassed the original intention and have become much more than just means of preserving and showing what did not fit in catalogues and film history books. After the Kuiper and the Peut, this project was continued. The most recent compilation to date was assembled in uh, 2017 by ICE curator Mark Paul Meyer and Elif Rongen Kainakci. This is Bits and Pieces 636 uh, to 647, the 58th reel in the series. There are only a few rules that curators follow in assembling the reels. The fragments must be unidentified. The curators are not allowed to edit the material. The item will be included in the reel as it has been found. Any form of material deterioration will be preserved as well. Fragments can also include negatives or soundtracks and will be preserved as such. Each reel is about 300 meters long with a projection time of approximately 15 minutes and typically includes 10 to 15 fragments. In an interview with uh, Christian Olesen, published in the journal Nexus in 2013, Mayer uh, talks about the role of the curator in assembling bits and pieces compilations and states that, I quote, Bits and pieces are meant as a format without an author, which allows the spectator to look over the shoulder of the archivist and into the archive." End of quote. For many years, this privileged perspective, looking over the shoulder of the archivist, was only possible for a spectator witnessing a projection of the Bits and Pieces collection in the museum theatres or at festival, or for found footage filmmakers approaching the museum to use the collection in their new production. 
With mass digitization and online access, this privileged perspective is becoming possible for many more people, inside and outside the film archival community. Thanks to recent digitization and online access projects carried out by heritage institutions in the last 15 years, we have seen the growth of a community of online users who can access for the first time a still quite limited uh, selection of material that is kept in the vaults of film archives. Today's, um, uh, today, users can access uh, uh, entire films, but also isolate fragments or single frames. They can enjoy a kind of access uh, that was once prerogative of film professionals, in particular archivists, scholars and filmmakers. This new approach to film heritage can be recognized in particular in the widespread practice of reusing and remixing archival fragments such as bits and pieces. Thanks to digitization, today it is much easier to use single bits and pieces fragments, pulling them out of the reels where they were edited by the museum curators. Users can choose an isolated fragment and use it for their goal, ignoring the linear sequence by which they were originally assembled. Approximately 50 bits and pieces are readily available for free download and reuse on the platform Open Images. And uh, on the I, uh, YouTube channel, 250 bits and pieces have been posted, and every week more are added. On the other hand, what has not changed much in recent years are the legal issues with regard to online access, reuse and remix possibilities. We, uh, as we have discussed in the first session uh, of uh, This is Film, when, uh, when we discuss copyrights, legal restrictions are the main obstacle for archives to make uh, their digitized holdings available online. The Bits and Pieces collection lives in a hybrid legal status. As these fragments are not identified, they cannot be considered public domain or orphans. However, the risk taken by uh, making them available for uh, reuse is considered very low, and the archive is willing to take such a risk. At this point, I would like to mention a few examples of uh, reuse of the Bits and Pieces collection. Let's wait until the end of this item. Okay, the first uh, example I'd like to mention is that of uh, Celluloid Remix, uh, an online contest uh, launched uh, for the first time in 2009 and again in 2012. A collaboration between iFilm Museum and the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, uh, led by i's uh, digital uh, presentation department uh, and uh, its manager, uh, Irene Hahn. The contest was intended for both film professionals and amateurs and was based on a selection of digitized film fragments from ICE collection. The contestants uh, were invited to remix the footage uh, into new short films with a new soundtrack. The second cellular remix contest focused on the theme found footage. For this edition, 60 fragments uh, from the Bits and Pieces collection were made available online for reuse and remix. 75 contestants uh, uh, took part to this edition. Uh, the second and more recent example uh, uh, focuses on the um, reuse of Bits and Pieces uh, by Jan Bot. So, who is Jan Bot, uh, a robot filmmaker launched in 2017. 
using algorithms uh, to recognize, select, and edit uh, film images, and inspired by online trending news, Yambot makes films using exclusively fragments from the Bits and Pieces collection. Yambot is a creation of filmmakers Pablo Nunez Palma and Brah, Bram Lochman. Based on the author's uh, custom written algorithm, uh, Yambot edits the selected fragments and title cards together to create approximately uh, 20 films a day that are typically 20 to 30 seconds long. Today, its online archive holds more than 20,000 films. The third and final project I would like to mention is entitled Soil in My Pocket. Uh, for two weeks uh, in the winter of uh, 2017, the building of iFilm Museum uh, acted as an urban screen for uh, two film essays focusing on the longings and dreams of migrants of the past. The installation was created by artist Ellert Heichema and Judith Quox and contained texts by Mick Svamborn. The video essays were made with material from his collection, in particular, bits and pieces. There are many more interesting examples of reuse of the bits and pieces collection, and today it will be reused once again by our guest here at I. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Daria Kochetkova, Kate Sacconi, Chong Zhao, Saif Ward and Stavros Markulakis, who will take over now. And on behalf of the group, uh, Kate will introduce our guest. So Rosella Catanese is a film scholar and DJ, a uh, VJ. <laughs> she received her PhD from Sapienza University of Rome in 2012. Her dissertation on film restoration and digital technology was published in 2013 and has been used uh, as a textbook in multiple university programs since. She is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Udine and adjunct professor of history of Italian cinema at NYU Florence. She is also a research fellow for the International Film Historical Project, Vis Visual Cultures of Trauma, Obliteration, and Reconstruction in Post-World War II Europe. Rosella's main areas of interest are film restoration and film archives, avant-garde and experimental cinema in Italy and France, cinema and intermediality, <laughs> futurism, synesthesia, uh, cinema and Italian history, media archaeology, and film and media literacy. She is the author of Futurist Cinema, Studies on Italian Avant-Garde Film, which was published in 2017, and is the co-editor of From Sensation to Synesthesia in Film and New Media, which was published in 2019. She has also written about silent film, color and film restoration, and 3D architectural video mapping, among other topics, and is currently working on both a book project on the 1924 avant-garde classic Ballet Mechanique and an edited collection on Italian experimental cinema. Rosella's interests in digital technology, avant-garde cinema, film history, and the archive converge in her work as a professional VJ, which she began doing in 2013 at the Tenex nightclub in Florence. During these live, immersive audiovisual sets, Rosella often generates her visuals by manipulating avant-garde films and other film and video archival materials. And now Rosella will perform her set with live musical accompaniment provided by Jan Willem Hagenbeek.
So my first question uh, for you, Rosella, is this performance was designed to draw from um, the Bits and Pieces collection. And we were curious to know uh, if what are the benefits and limitations, if any, um, from drawing solely from one archival collection for your source material? Uh, did you find working with the Bits and Pieces collection um, to be different than normal um, or not? Thank you so much, both for your introduction and for the question. Um, of course, the Bits and Pieces collection has a peculiarity. It's a collection of unidentified fragments. So already the fragmentation and the variety of the content are very peculiar uh, elements for the for the content for the visual content of the of the performance, and this is something completely different from picking up some sequences or uh, fragments from other films where I have uh, already maybe um, a selection in mind or uh, a certain knowledge. Uh, I have known the collection and uh, look at throughout it uh, to select something that in my opinion could work very well with certain music and also because I wanted to stress some aesthetic values that are somehow different from those that I've um, performed with in the past uh, editions and in other past uh, shows. Um, now I'm going to give the mic over to Sai for her question. Thank you. Um, so, in recent years, the moving image has migrated into museums, perhaps signaling the recognition of cinema as an art form worthy of preservation within traditional institutions. Do you think that VJing has become more relevant since museums have embraced the moving image? Thank you so much. This is a very interesting question. I don't know whether this is somehow connected, because uh, my experience of a, as a VJ that uses certain materials to perform, of course, is a very peculiar one. Uh, usually VJs are also creative um, filmmakers or graphic designers that um, are dealing with the material in a different way. So, of course, this is a kind of proof of the remix culture that in the contemporary media age we witness daily, as a daily practice, really, and also as a part of a phenomenon that has been told by scholars as a, um, a relocation, so the shifting of um, the media experience, not anymore only um, related to the movie theaters, but also somehow closer to uh, um, daily experience on other kind of screens, from mobile screens to the media facade, and also to uh, possible different settings, such as the clubs or other places where the VJ sets are performed. At the same time, uh, I don't know if this experience here at I uh, it will have other uh, following uh, practices in other ways to mix and to reuse the materials in a very creative way such as this. Um, I think that this is a really avant-garde and experimental um, idea of using the, the collection and also is something that might somehow engage differently the audience, somehow must... Um, open up the discussion with different kind of experiences uh, that are also related to a dialogue with the music, so a different interpretation, a different um, way to valorize and to promote the collections. I hope I've, that I've answered. Thank you so much. And um, over to Stavros for the next question. Thank you, Saiv. Hello, Rosella. I would like to ask you about submissive media literacy. Um, so, as a film historian with main interest of focus in preservation, futurism, synesthesia, restoration philosophy, and avant-garde, do you capitalize on your dual background and subliminally expose your audience to classical film history? And if so, could you elaborate on the contrast of the historical art artifacts in a contemporary club setting and the audience reception? Thank you very much. Yes, of course, my background is the probably the most peculiar element for a certain kind of VJ sets. Usually VJ sets are performed in a way that is somehow typical in many other, many worldwide clubs. Uh, so very often you see um, computer-generated images, um, very straight and simple graphic designs. Whereas in my 
idea is to is to promote the media culture in a different way so that actually the avant-garde or other non-fiction material can be used in a very performative way and especially for the experimental footage that offers a different aesthetic value compared to narrative cinema uh, where of course the storytelling is pivotal. Uh, in the experimental cinema, in the non-fiction films, in the avant-garde, you find that the aesthetic values have a different role, have a different uh, element. And these, in my opinion, can dialogue very well with a context that doesn't expect this. And somehow can create a new way to educate the people to the moving images, to the film heritage, to certain heritage of the visual experience that they maybe don't have access to, they don't know, uh, in a context that usually don't offer such, uh, doesn't offer, sorry, such um, possibilities. Uh, so yes, of course, this is probably the most peculiar part of my personal uh, contribution to the VJSAT community, we can say. Thank you very much. And I would like to introduce Daria for the next uh, question. Uh, hello. Uh, my question will be more related to the future of your VJ career and maybe even the possibilities of it. So I was wondering if you have ever thought of making the performance all by yourself, so like mixing the music and doing the videos and putting it all together to one performance uh, done by yourself. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting point. I'm not a musician nor a DJ, uh, so uh, I have done some... Uh, editing for music videos once, but um, it was a very uh, isolated experience. So uh, I don't consider myself an editor or a director. Uh, my creative approach is mostly based on the idea of remixing materials. And my knowledge of archival film can offer such possibility to a different experience of the VJ set. At the same time, of course, I like very much the idea of a uh, complete work of installation like you propose. So it, it, mm, it's something that maybe I, I can work on, but not considering mm, only myself as a creator. Since I'm not a musician, I like very much music, but mm, it would be somehow mm, a kind of mm, bad attitude to consider myself able of everything. I think that I should rely on my own skills, but also involve the people that I um, that I like most. That uh, I think that I uh, can find inspiration from. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, also, I have a question from Chong she, since she is not here, and uh, she wants to know. Uh, if you maybe can speak a little about the tension between the liveness of the VJ set and the fact that many of our peers are experiencing this only virtually, and if you maybe consider doing more live streaming VJs, VJing in the future. Okay. Um, the idea of this tension between the different contexts is, of course, something that uh, I've always thought about because uh, I come from a different background and especially the VJ community is more related to the creative approach and so video making and everything that somehow have, has a kind of language that can um, communicate easily with the context of the contemporary setting of clubs. Uh, so I feel that I am a bit an outsider in this sense. At the same time, I think that um, this idea of the um, of the liveness of the um, uh, feedback from the audience that very often appreciate the work, appreciate also the idea that the virtual scenography can offer something different from what they are used to, is also interesting for me and is also productive because I understand what are their preferences, what uh, what people enjoy the most. Um, so I guess that this idea of trying to find a balance between you know, your own uh, work, your own uh, creative approach and the context around you and the feedback from also the audience that of course is a very peculiar audience because it's not the typical audience of the uh, movie theaters. It's a moving audience who's dancing, who's appreciating differently the music, who's focused on the music rather than the, the visuals. So I'm trying to engage them throughout the visual and also to offer something different, something that 
can uh, can really make them uh, experiencing a very immersive um, performance. So I, I guess that this is the point of this tension, if I have answered. Yeah, thanks a lot for your answers. Now I'm giving the word back to Giovanna. Okay, um, we are wrapping up now. Uh, thank you, Rossella. Uh, thank you, uh, Jan Willem. Uh, thank you to Daria, Kate, Chong, Saiv and Stavros uh, and everybody following online. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you to all my colleagues here at I. Uh, um, and I hope to see you all back with us um, uh, for the next This Is Film session with uh, Richard Misek, Charlie Shackleton, Oscar Rabi, and their uh, VR project, uh, A Machine for Viewing. Bye bye. <laughs>